Hello and welcome Rise Community Church Online. I'm Pastor Frank. Hope you guys are all doing well. Can't wait to see you guys this evening. Please come out and uh, let's all worship together and listen to the message together. Um, it's today, tonight at, at 6. I, again, hope to see you all there. Go with me now to uh, some prayer. Father, we come before you and we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this day, Father. Father, I pray, Lord, that you just continue to pour your blessings down upon us, Father. Father, I pray for protection over all of us, Lord, over our brothers and sisters. I pray for a healing, Lord, of those who are sick, Father, those who are spiritually sick, Father. I pray for healing over them, Father. I pray for the power of your Holy Spirit to fill them, Father. I pray that you just continue to move, Lord. I pray for an outpouring of your Spirit, Father. I pray for peace over this world, peace over this nation, Father, of the things, Lord, that are going on, Father, the madness, the craziness, Father. I pray that your word goes out, Father, that your truth breaks the lies of the enemy, Father, that you bring those, Lord, to their knees, Father, and allow them to surrender to you, Father, to know you as Lord, as our King, Father. We pray for those, Lord, who are on the front lines right now, Father. We pray for peace over them. We pray for their families, Lord. We pray for just protection over them, Father. I know that they're uh, tired, and I know that they 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 uh, they they hurt and they, and they have pain over over not seeing their families, Father, for periods of time, Father. I pray for them, Lord, right now to to just come. Uh, to, to, to know you, to know your peace, Father, and to, Father, I pray that you just continue to, again, just move, Father. We pray against all these things, Lord, that are going on right now, Father. We pray that you continue to, uh, to, to show us direction, Father. We pray for a church home, Lord. We pray for a place that we can go to and worship you. We thank you, though, for the things that you have created right now for us, Father, to do. We pray for our community groups, Lord. We pray for uh, our congregation, Lord. We pray for our brothers and sisters, Father, that you just continue to uh, strengthen them, continue to bring them back, Father, to, 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 to your peace, to, to know you, to Father, to be renewed by their, by, by their minds, to be renewed, Father. Lord, just go before us now, Lord. Go before us now as we worship you. We, we, we surrender to you, Father, this, this day. We love you. We honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go with us now to a time of worship. I was born.
Yeah. 
turn shame into glory is you're the only one who can you turn morning to dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory is you're the Hi guys, I'm Frankie. Welcome to Rise Community Church Online. Our college group is meeting at Pastor Chopper's house at December 19th. Check our app for more information. Hey guys, hope to see you guys all at Calvary Chapel Plantation at 6 p.m. And now is Pastor Pete's uh, today's message. Good morning and welcome to uh, Rise Community Church Online. I'm Pastor Pete and 
Happy to be here with you today. Uh, I'm also looking forward to seeing each and every one of you tonight at Calvary Chapel Plantation at 6 p.m. We're going to have our live service uh, together uh, for the month of December. Uh, if those of you who could not attend last, uh, the last time we had one, we miss you guys. We're going to gather together. It's going to be safe. We're going to follow, follow our protocols. Make sure you bring your mask. And we have enough distance there that we will be uh, safe and healthy. So I look forward to seeing you. Uh, God bless you guys. Today we are wrapping up the book of Acts. We are doing the last two chapters of the book of Acts. And uh, we've been on quite a journey from the beginning. We're, we're, we're finishing up this weekend. But next weekend I'm going to take a time with uh, some of the pastors to kind of talk about the highlights of uh, in the, you know, the things that we've learned, uh, the things that God has spoken to us during uh, our study uh, through the book of Acts verse by verse. Uh, we've learned many important lessons uh, about the church, about the beginning of the church, about what, uh, you know, the foundational beliefs of the church. Uh, it, it was, it's been excellent. Um, and, ne- and, and, and like I said, next week we'll take some time to talk a little bit more about the bigger picture. Uh, and remember, all the services are available online. They're also available to download in podcasts. So if you want to catch up or if you missed the section, they're always there available for you to study verse by verse through the book of Acts. Uh, Today we're going to experience the last two chapters of Paul's journey to Rome. Uh, But we we don't get to end it. So I'm going to give you a heads up right now that we're not not going to get to the end of Paul's life at the end of uh, Acts. Uh, We are just going to conclude with him arriving and, and the kind of the last two, the, ne- the next two years of his ministry in Rome. And then I'll talk a little bit more in detail as we get there. But these last two chapters, we really are presented uh, as Paul is traveling from, uh, from Caesarea to Rome. Uh, w- one big uh, challenge and crisis that occurs and how Paul deals with crisis. That's really the lesson that I want us to draw from today because we as believers uh, have to uh, think about how we respond to crisis. It reveals to us how we should deal with those great crises as we lead our homes, our workplaces, our society, and of course, in our positions in the body of Christ. Uh, I, th- I think we would agree that we are in a time of crisis. We are at a time of crisis on different levels of crisis. We have a, the crisis of, of course, the COVID epidemic, the crisis uh, of, of, our, of, our, of our country being uh, kind of split and torn, and, and a lot of uh, damage has happened between people. Uh, personally, I know many, and uh, probably most of us, uh, the crisis of our finances and our homes and our bills and people losing employment and being on unemployment and and, and all those difficulties. And as a church, uh, I've talked with many pastors over these couple of months, and, and they're all facing a crisis in their church. We are also facing a crisis as a church because we have, uh, it's been difficult for us to meet, and it's been difficult for us to connect and stay connected to the body of Christ. And, it's, and that has brought its own unique challenges to this crisis. So, how we deal with those crises is important. And that's really, I think, the powerful lesson that's here for us in the last two chapters. Uh, this is like the great adventure of Paul heading to Rome. You know, and, and, one of the, and we're going to really look at kind of what exudes from the life of Paul. What, what behavior do we see that we should emulate as believers? Remember, he challenged the believers to uh, do as I do, be like me, not, to, not so much uh, about him, but how he follows Christ, we should also like, use him as an example. So we're going to try to see and pay attention to his behavior during this crisis, and we want to emulate this. And the first thing that we look at is that Paul's role as a counselor, as a counselor to those around him, to those uh, who, who are believers and, and unbelievers alike. He is a counselor to people. And I believe that that as believers, we're called to be counselors, counselors of spiritual wisdom. And we should have people in our lives that are counselors to us, 
of spiritual wisdom. Um, and Paul has served in that role many times throughout the book of Acts and throughout the rest of the New Testament. Um, he believed it was important to give counsel. He wasn't afraid to give counsel. Uh, and even those who were enemies by circumstance, that didn't stop, them, stop him from being a spiritual counsel to them and challenge them with truth. Um, and we begin with the decision of the centurion. Now, he, he's got to take Paul all the way to Rome, which is not an easy trek. And this is the end of the summer, the beginning uh, of, the, of the fall for them, so around September. And this is probably the worst time to start traveling because you, you, you're in danger during the fall, and in the winter it becomes an impossible feat. So they're trying to move quickly and, and get Paul, and not only Paul, but multiple prisoners to Rome to be heard. Uh, the centurion finds a ship that's leaving uh, uh, Caesarea, and they, their desire is to travel 80 miles in one day, kind of get to the next point. But Paul is, is allowed to get ready. He's allowed to get his needs together. And it's recorded, very importantly, that uh, just the kindness of the Roman officer uh, in helping him. But also, many believers in that community that came out uh, to, to help meet Paul and his needs. Uh, so again, it just shows us the heart of the church and people that we never even get to hear their name, but it, but but in, the, in, in 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 God's book, they, their names are there, and and they and they, they showed kindness to Paul in his time of need. Um, now again, this is the seasons of storms, so there's some danger there, and, and so they're trying. They go for that little uh, travel, and, and it's difficult. So they try to find a faster ship, and they get on a large ship from Egypt. Uh, that originated in Egypt and had about 276 passengers with wheat and, uh, and, and, and a bunch of supplies that were being brought to Rome. But the strong winds, again, they hinder their progress. And for many days, they struggle to, uh, trying to cover 100, uh, you know, and 30 miles, but they have to make pit stops. They make a pit stop at Fair Haven because it's been a difficult journey up to this point. Uh, and, and it's a reality that it's going to continue to be difficult. And you know where we're going. Um, and right there is really kind of the first test for, for uh, Paul's ability to counsel and to give direction. Uh, and he tries. He tries to convince the, uh, the Roman centurion to, to wait and to winter here in, in this place because it's going to be even more difficult going forward. But there's such a pressure, and the reality is uh, this is our first lesson because they should be listening to Paul. Paul has a great deal of experience, but also Paul has the ear, uh, you know, he has his ear towards the Lord, and, and they should listen to his wisdom, but they don't. And as a matter of fact, these men who are unbelievers the, the, the captain and, and, the, and the Romans, they uh, don't really seek the will of God going forward. And that's our first lesson because uh, the reality is, is that being a believer for a very long time and being a pastor who sat and counseled people for, for a long time, I, the reality is, is that we function much more like the captain and much more like the centurion because we really don't, tend to seek God and his direction and his wisdom on very important moments in our life. You know, for many of us, we really don't seek the Lord in making some of the biggest decisions in our life, about our schooling, about our career, about our future, about our relationships, about who we're going to marry or who we're going to go into business with, whatever the case may be. We tend to shoot from the gut or from our experience or just from the wisdom of the world. But do we really seek the wisdom of God? We, we, we often find ourselves shipwrecked down the road, not because it was inevitable, but because we really didn't seek God's direction and wisdom. And that's an important understanding for us that we need to have, that we should seek the Lord in all things. 
you know, my life first. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Acknowledge God. Other verses say, uh, you know, ask God for all things, and he shall make your path straight. You know, we tend to trust our reasoning and our thinking, and we tend to uh, not seek God in the most prominent things in our lives, but we end up not on a straight path, but on a, a often running circles. You know, we said before, Paul tries to give them good counsel and tells them to stay there. You know, let them winter there and, and not head out into the stormy season. But the men in charge didn't give any value to this warning. And they're going to regret this. Unfortunately, there's going to be great regret. Before Paul, uh, before long, Paul's proved right. As soon as they set off, it becomes a stormy wind. And the word is translated uh, tempestuous. And uh, it actually gives us the English word typhoon. So they're in the middle of this major storm that's growing worse and worse. And, it, and to the point that uh, the, the, the crew is, is desperate just to survive. So let's pick it up in Acts chapter 27, and we're going to read verses 17 to 20, and it's going to give us the picture of what they're experiencing because, again, they, they didn't listen to the wise counsel. In verse 17, it says that the sailors bound ropes around the hull of the ship to strengthen it. They were afraid of being driven across the sandbars of Sirtis off the African coast, so they lowered the sea anchor to slow the ship and were driven before the wind. The next day, as gale force winds continued to batter the ship, the crew began throwing the cargo overboard. The following day, they even took some of the ship's gear and threw it overboard. The terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars until at last all hope was gone. So this is dangerous. They find themselves in a dangerous situation, a, a life and death situation. And if you can imagine, they, they, they cannot navigate. They cannot see the sun or the moon or the stars. It is just pure storm for days and days. You know, and, and the situation seems hopeless. And this all happens because really two men would not listen to God's messenger. Again, we, how many times have we found ourselves in storms because we did not listen to the word of God. That we didn't listen to spiritual wisdom. We could have avoided these storms, but instead we, we, we seek our own and, and, and make our own choices. You know, again, as, as, as a pastor and as a counselor, I've often given wisdom that's not only not received, you know, uh, and, but ignored, not followed. And I have seen these men and women that I have been part of their lives and I've tried to tell them this is what's coming down. This is the storm that you're heading into. And they don't. And then I've had to see them shipwreck themselves as a result. So Paul not only functions as a counselor here, but now he has to take a different role. And as believers, guess what? This is another example of how we deal in crisis. He, becomes, he takes on the role of encourager. And if you want to take a look at verses 21 through 44, we see this kind of happen. Paul, again, we see this pattern. Paul is put on trial, but he ends up being the judge and the jury for the people that are actually putting him on trial. Well, right here, he begins as the prisoner, but he ends up being the captain of the ship. We see this behavior before, right? And understand that crisis does not make a person. A crisis reveals what a person is really made up of. It, it, it's, the, it's the squeeze that produces who you are. And, and a crisis will tend to bring true leadership to, to the foreground. People will notice it. You know, Paul gently rebukes the centurion and the pilot and says, listen, I, I warned you, but now uh, there, he's also going to acknowledge that you're going to be spared, but you're going to be spared because of me, because God has a plan for me to get to where he wants me to get to, and he is being generous, and he's going to rescue everybody on this ship. 
And again, this is a lesson for us to be encouragers in crisis, to not be afraid to take leadership that God has given us as an opportunity to lead in times of difficulty. Why? Because this is ultimately the greatest testimony. They're getting a live action uh, believer testimony here, you know, and it's an opportunity to bear witness. You know, and I wanted to share a story in regards to this, and, and, and it's not, this isn't a, a boast, but this is an experience that I had like this. Because God had called me, and God has called me to lead, and God has, has, has called me to stand and bear witness for Him. Uh, and when I worked at the hospital early on in my 20s, there was a major crisis that, I won't go into all the details, but I worked with, with, with uh, folks that were struggling with mental illness, and uh, I was on the crisis floor, so I would work with the crisis, folks in crisis. And then downstairs uh, was a place where people would live. It was a long-term uh, facility for folks with severe mentally, mental illnesses. And as I was coming up to take my shift, uh, there was a conflict that broke out between a female and a male, and it got uh, very brutal. The, the male began to beat on this uh, young girl, uh, it is scary. So uh, the person that was working there locked themselves in the office. But I was there in the middle and God compelled me to react and to take leadership. So I was able to stop them, not physically, but I had to do that just, and I believe God was with me, with just authority, be able to speak and, and, and they, and, but it didn't stop there. The issue progressed more because once he stopped, the female went into the room and came out with a butcher knife, which she wasn't supposed to have. And now I have a butcher knife aimed at me and at one of the other folks, the, 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 the gentleman who's mentally ill. And I had to, again, talk them down and get the knife away from her. And thank God it ended peacefully and uh, they were able to get the help that they needed, the medical help and the mental health help. But I use as an example that we don't always get to choose when a crisis is coming. But call, God does call us to stand in those moments of crisis and take leadership as believers uh, to, to, to spiritually lead and to understand that we can't just pass the buck on somebody else. And Paul here not only begins to lead and gives direction, almost like the captain of the ship, but also he encourages them. In Acts 27, uh, 23 to 26, this is what Paul says. For the last night an angel of, the, of God to whom I belong and, sir, and whom I serve stood beside me. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I, believe, for I believe in God, and it will be just as he said, but we will be shipwrecked on an island. So uh, God, through an angel, reveals to Paul what's going to happen. and says, don't be afraid, and everyone on the ship is going to make it. As long, we'll see, as long as, 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 as they stay on board. So Paul explains this to them. He encourages them. Now, Understand these are people who are not, they don't have faith. There was a lot of people on that ship. There were also prisoners on that ship. There were the Roman soldiers on that ship. There was the captain on that ship. They all had an opportunity, a front seat, to see a faithful servant of God trusting in God. You know, we are going to face really difficult situations spiritually. We as leaders have to stand in the storm. We have to stand in the crisis. And we're called to provide leadership to, God, you know, to God's people, to our families, in our jobs, in all places. You know, I, I've experienced this in church again and again. You know, when the church is in crisis, I've been in church when it's been in crisis multiple times. 
or I've been with a family when they're in crisis because a loved one is sick or dying or has died. We have to stand in those moments and stand as witnesses for God. And in church, what I see is a lot of times folks will flee the crisis of the body of Christ to go find greener pastures somewhere else or to go lick their wounds. When we're called to stand, if there's a crisis in the body of Christ, if there's a crisis in our church at Rice Community Church, we're called to stand. Not to run off, but to trust in God, to seek Him, to be there for one another, to give spiritual encouragement to one another, to give spiritual wisdom to one another. It's important. We have that opportunity. But unfortunately, some people choose to bail when there's a crisis. And maybe you've experienced this in your life with people that you love that bailed on you in your greatest moment of need. Or maybe in the body of Christ where people bail on you when they're needed in the body of Christ, when they're needed in that church. Well, we have the same experience here in verses 30 through 32. It says, Then the sailors tried to abandon the ship. They lowered the lifeboat as though they were going to put out anchors for the front of the ship. But Paul said to the commanding officer and the soldiers, You will all die unless the the sailors stay aboard. So the soldiers cut the ropes to the lifeboat and let it drift away. You get the picture there? And do you get the spiritual lesson there? You might be in a marriage that's in crisis. And you're looking at that lifeboat and saying, I can get off of this. I can get out of this marriage. You need to cut that rope. Let that boat float away. Let that notion float away. You need to stand. Trusting and in faith. Is it your employment status? Where is your trust? Where is your trust in God? Is it our church? I have to trust in God. That God is in control. Even in the midst of a storm, God's will is going to be done. But you see, a crisis is an opportunity to demonstrate our faith, but it also can be a a reality that reveals our lack of faith, our lack of belief. So Paul is telling, listen, if if you let these men off, they're going to die. Anyone who leaves the ship is going to die if they go out on their own. God has promised that he will rescue all of us. Every single person will make it. Again, he's an encourager. He not only shares the word of God with them and warns them and tells them how to behave in this crisis. He also sets himself as an example. And he continues to be an example. After that rough night where everybody wanted to bail, the first thing he does in the morning, he says, um, Oh, before, before I go there, I just want to share something else. But, but what he does is he gets up in the morning and he, and he breaks bread and openly gives thanks to God in the middle of this storm. And he passes that bread out. And guys, that encouragement, the whole group, felt better. All of the the soldiers, the, the, the prisoners, the sailors, they were all better. You know, you've heard me talk about this before. It changes the atmosphere of the situation simply by putting your trust in God. A visible faith. That's the role that we should play in our homes 
moms and dads. Brothers and sisters, children, aunts, uncles. We can choose to become a thermostat or a thermometer in crisis. I've given you the example many times that in my own home, I can either choose to be the thermostat or the thermometer. So if I'm having a bad day and I let that come out and I uh, don't really give a good example, guess what? It, 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 that, that attitude permeates the entire house. It discourages my children and my wife. So I've learned that the opposite is true, that if I can remain a visible presence of trusting in God and being faithful to God and being an encourager, even in the crisis, that temperature is set in my home. We have that ability in our relationships and in our workplace Instead of being gossipers and being divisive, we can do, we can affect by being a person who sets the temperature as an encourager. Paul not only encourages them, but he ends up actually saving the prisoners. What do I mean? In verse 42. It says that the soldiers wanted to kill the prisoners to make sure they didn't swim ashore and escape. Because remember, if they would lose their prisoners, guess what? They would die themselves. So now they've recognized that everyone's going to have to, Paul says, now it's time. We're going to, we can make it to shore. It's right here. That's the island that we're going to be shipwrecked on. We need to get out there and swim. But the officers, the, the prisoners, the soldiers want to kill the prisoners. But listen to what the officer says. Verse 43, but the commanding officer wanted to spare Paul, so he didn't let them carry out their plan. Then he ordered all who could swim to jump over first and make for land. The others held onto planks or debris from the broken ship, so everyone escaped safely to shore, just as God had promised. That could have all ended differently. If Paul would have just thought about himself, if he would have just bailed. But understand that his, what he had shown that officer already had changed his heart. So it actually stops them from killing the prisoners and everyone is saved and everyone reaches the shore. Paul's presence saved their lives just as the Lord had promised all of them. And because of his life and his behavior, his attitude, it made the difference that it rescued the prisoners. And this tells us a valuable lesson. He says, do not underestimate what your testimony can do. How you live in front of your family and friends and co-workers matters most. It matters more than what you say is how you live and what you do. You might think it doesn't matter. You might think that they're making fun of you. You might think that they think something of you, but the reality is that if they're watching a life of obedience, it can serve as an example that will save them as it leads them to Christ. The reality is that storms of life reveal your character. That's something that's awesome about the storm, about the crisis. And we're in crisis, folks. Are you standing in faith? Or, do, or are you giving in to fear and anxiety? Are you standing in faith for your family as you face financial difficulties? Are you standing in faith for your church as we struggle to find a place and to stay connected? 
And there's so much need, guys. I cannot tell you how much need is in our body of Christ right now. And we're doing everything we can to meet those serious needs. Are you standing with us? Or has the crisis revealed a struggle with faith? Even in the worst storm, even in the worst crisis, the storm is not going to hide the face of God from you. And it will definitely not hinder the purposes of God for us. God's will will be done. Even in this horrible circumstances that Paul is facing, God's will is going to be done. And Paul has come to rely on that. He has faith that what God has said will come to pass. So he knows he's getting to Rome. One way or the other. And he gets onto the island. And again, we, we see Paul's character. Instead of resting and saying, hey, I rescued all you guys because you know, God, God rescued me, he, he goes to work helping gather wood for fire. And all of a sudden, a snake viper comes and bites him. And this is not the first time. We know that this has happened before. And the people react to this, you know, the people on the island say it was Malta. They say, he must be a horrible prisoner that he would survive now and God's judgment would be on him. And they watched him. Guess what? Paul didn't freak out. Paul didn't start running around shouting, I've been bitten by a snake. They're watching him. He doesn't react. He doesn't blow up. And he doesn't die. Why, why did God choose to do that? Well, obviously, Testimony. But, but uh, it's so easy for us to look at the situation because we're in a crisis and we, we can freak out. And so people are even watching us in our reaction to the crisis and how we react to the crisis. Listen, how do we react to uh, a, a, a report of, of, of a disease that we, re that we have? How do we respond to losing a loved one? How do we respond... Uh, it, 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 with the loss of a job. How do we respond to those things? Matters. It matters. We can't lose it and freak out. But we need to just rush to the feet of the Lord and, and, and seek Him and trust Him. That's hard, right? It's hard for me. I admit it. But I know it's the right thing to do because it's a testimony. Our kids are watching how we respond to crisis. You know, as Christians, we have to develop this understanding that we always have to be alert. We always have to keep in mind that we're being watched. Uh, and and we've got to recognize that we need to use every opportunity to magnify the Lord. This is a crisis moment, and Paul is up for the challenge. So Paul remains on Malta for three months, and during this time, he helps the people that are there. He, he prays for healing and, and, and everyone on that island that was sick is healed. He shares God with that entire island. Not only them, but every soldier that was there. Every, uh, you know, the captain and all his shipmates were there. And he gets to Rome. He gets to the place that God said he would do what? That he would be his witness. So the first thing that Paul does because of his desire and love for his people is that he goes to the Jews in Rome and he gathers all those from the synagogues and all the leaders and he spends an entire day talking with them and sharing with them and, and show, showing how, how scriptures are built on Christ. In the law and in the prophets, Christ is there. And the result is that some come to faith and some were pers persuaded and some were not. Let's look at verse 24 of, of chapter 28. It says, Some were persuaded by the things he said, but others did not believe. And after they had argued back and forth among themselves, they left with this final word from Paul. And Paul quotes 
the prophet Isaiah. It says, The Holy Spirit was right when He said to your ancestors through Isaiah the prophet, Go and say to these people, When you hear what I say, you will not understand, and when you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For your hearts, for the hearts of these people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear, and they have closed their eyes, so their eyes cannot see, and their ears cannot hear, and their hearts cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. And he continues, So I want you to know that this salvation from God has been offered to the Gentiles, and they will accept it. And for the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his expense. He welcomed all visitors to him. He boldly proclaimed, boldly proclaimed the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, and no one tried to stop him. A lot, of it, a lot is revealed here. First and foremost, that Paul had such a love for his people. He writes the book of Romans for the Jewish people in Rome. So he takes time to write this letter for them to explain in more detail their need to have faith in Christ. Some responded, but some did not. And he looks towards Isaiah and says, I knew that we know that this was going to be the case. And maybe you've experienced someone like that in your life where there's a difference between listening and hearing. And there's a difference between seeing and perceiving. In my own life, I did a lot of listening in my youth, but that doesn't mean I heard what I needed to hear. And I saw a lot of things. In other words, I knew about the story of Christ, but I didn't perceive the truth of it all until that moment that the Holy Spirit drew me. And maybe we have loved ones like that, that we're talking to them, but there's no understanding And you've shown them in your own life, in your testimony. But they're not really perceiving. So we continue to pray for those. So for two years, you say, okay, so we don't get to hear what happened to Paul, what happened to the trial. We know that for two years he did what God had told him to. He said, you're, you're going to be my witness in Rome to the Jews and the Gentiles. So he literally, for two years, unfettered, open house, everyone came in who wanted to come here to hear about the gospel. For two whole years. During these two years, Paul wrote Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon. And we say, well, what happened with the case? We, we don't know all the details. We do know that this first trial, he ended up being acquitted. He, he continued to go and do ministry. And during the, the period of a, uh, A.D. 63 through 67, we know this because he, he went on to write Timothy and Titus. Uh, and we know that he was once again arrested around 67. And this time the situation was more drastic. Like I said, remember early on the Roman church did not, I mean the Roman government didn't perceive the Christians uh, as a danger. They saw them as Jewish believers. And that began to change as we get closer to 70. And the Romans' attitude towards Christians began to change. So he's arrested again, but this time it's real prison and he's treated like a criminal, and, and we hear him in his last days share his loneliness and ask Timothy to come back to him and 
Mark to come back and to bring him his, you know, to bring him his coat. And tradition tells us that he was beheaded ultimately in Rome in 67 or 68. You know, and, and while we can look at that as a sad thing, we need to understand that most of the apostles met a grim fate. And if our faith is about just living in this long, extended life, then it, it could be negative, right? But if we look at it like Paul, who said to live is Christ and to die is gain, then we know that he gained something in his last moment. He gained a place in heaven. I want to close up this week by reminding us that we have just spent a good year in the book of Acts. And I pray that it has transformed you as it's transformed me. I pray that the lessons that we see and that we've learned, we, we just don't forget. My challenge to you, my, my friends, is, is to allow the Word of God to renew your mind. Allow the Spirit of God to confront us with the things that we need to allow Him to change in us. I challenge you to continue to grow in the knowledge of Christ. I challenge you to let your roots grow down deep in Him. I challenge you to not be a believer that's 10 miles wide and 2 inches deep. And I pray that today you see that the example that Paul sets is an example for me and you. An example in the crises of life that we experience and that we're in the midst of right now, that we can stand and be a testimony in our homes, in our marriages, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our community, and in this world. Don't wait for somebody else to be that example. God's calling you to be that example. And me, we have to make a personal decision and choice. And I pray that I can live up to this example that Paul has said. And I pray for you that you can live this example. I love you guys. And that's my prayer for us today as a church and brothers and sisters. So let's go before the Lord. Father, that is my simple prayer. We are broken and flawed people. But Lord, when I see Paul, I'm encouraged because I I know that it was your work in him. So do that work in us. Let us do, let us have your way in our lives that we can stand like Paul stood courageously wherever we may be today, whatever crisis we might face today. Let us truly live the life you've called us to. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. I really look forward to seeing you tonight. If you can make it, be there at 6 o'clock. We're going to have a beautiful service and, and have some time to see each other again. God bless you. See you tonight.